Normally, on this show, I interview a guest about what their favorite movie is, and that is what we are doing today. Don't go anywhere. But before we do that, I want to redirect the question to you, the viewer. What is your favorite movie? Is it a beloved classic like The Godfather or The Shawshank Redemption? Or maybe it's a childhood classic like The Lion King or The Sandlot. It can be a lot of fun to gush about these movies with other people because, well, most of the time people have seen them and usually people like them. And it can be a lot of fun to connect with other people through these universally beloved films. I mean, I've done it plenty of times. In fact, on this very show, we've covered films like that, like uh, Back to the Future and Fight Club and Pride and Prejudice and many others. But what happens when your favorite film is something a bit more obscure? Maybe it's a little too weird for people, like Donnie Darko. Or maybe it just didn't really get a lot of attention when it first came out, like Office Space. Hell, maybe it's in an entirely different language, like Akira or Amelie. You know, these are all great films, but these are things that keep people from discovering and or experiencing them. Now, some people might see these as barriers that keep us from connecting from certain film fans. But for me, these are just entryways in finding new and fresh perspectives and also expanding our film palette as a whole. This is especially the case for today's film. Not only is it in another language, it's in Czechoslovakian, not only is it a weird film, it's bonkers and experimental and crazy, but it also didn't get a lot of attention when it first came out because it was banned by the Czechoslovakian government for being too subversive and too blasphemous. This is the 1966 surrealist masterpiece Daisies, directed by Vera Hichlova. It's a really deep cut that not even the most devoted of film buffs may have come across. You have to believe me when I tell you that this film is unlike anything you have ever seen. I know that can sound hyperbolic and trite because a lot of people say it about a lot of things, but just trust me on this one, okay? This film is unlike anything you have ever seen, which makes me incredibly excited to talk about it alongside actress, director, and dear friend, Anna Dale Robinson. Hello and welcome to My Favorite Movie Is, a podcast all about reaffirming the power of film through fresh perspectives on beloved movies. My name is Larry Fried and I am a filmmaker, writer, editor, podcaster, and most importantly, film buff who every other week sits down with other passionate movie fans as they share the personal stories behind their favorite movies. Before we get going, I always like to remind people that we go way past the red tape and deep into spoilers on every episode of this show. So if you haven't seen the film that we're discussing today, you've been warned. If you're looking for an episode covering a film that you have seen, I implore you to check out our show page on your go-to podcasting app or check out our YouTube channel and subscribe and hit the notification bell. The link to that channel is in the show notes. Thank you so much for your time and your energy and your attention. We know you listen to plenty of podcasts and we are lucky to be amongst them. So without any further ado, let's get started. Before we dive deep into the conversation, let's first meet our guest. I'm Anna. I'm an actress and a filmmaker. I live in Brooklyn right now. You may not be familiar with Anna or her work, but that's okay because her career is only just beginning. I've been working in film production since January, so six or seven months now. And in that time, she has already assisted on sets for Apple TV Plus and HBO Max, has acted alongside greats like Richard Kind, and has worked with some incredibly successful producers in the industry today, like Molly Asher, who produced the most recent Best Picture winner, Nomadland, and Christine Vachon, who she currently works with at Killer Films. Christine has produced some very notable films as of late, including Zola, Dark Waters, and First Reformed. However, alongside this incredibly successful resume, I know Anna first and foremost as a dear friend and collaborator. I had the pleasure of going to film school with you, Larry, Mason Gross <laughs> School of the Arts, class uh, of 2020. Alma mater, <laughs> 2019, 2020. 
This is where Anna and I became good friends, working on a number of each other's films, swapping advice and feedback. In fact, this back and forth continues to this day. I was lucky enough to be involved in her latest short film, Crumbs, which we speak about briefly in today's episode. Centered on a complex female friendship, it was immediately apparent that Anna's unique cinematic voice was greatly inspired by films just like Daisy's and bold, powerful female filmmakers just like Vera Hitchlova, which makes her a perfect guest to talk about this film. I hope you enjoy our conversation with Anna Dale Robinson. Anna, obviously I'm very excited to have you on the show because we're good friends and I love talking to you, but also your film choice is so exciting for me. For those who uh, can't read the title of this episode, um, this episode is on daisies. If you haven't seen this film, you absolutely should. Uh, I know it's available on Criterion and HBO Max as we speak to stream, uh, which is an incredible feat of accessibility as far as I'm concerned. Um, so you should check it out. If you haven't, still listen and you can just gain our insights. Maybe this will convince you to watch it. But to give you even more context, Daisies is a film that was part of the Czech New Wave. It's a Czechoslovakian film, uh, also a feminist film, independent film, all the things that so many of the other films we've talked about are not in the best way. And I think the most appropriate question to start off this conversation with, besides for the fact that I always start off a conversation on our podcast this way, is how did you find this film? How did you discover it? What was your impression? What stuck out to you the most when you first watched it? I have an embarrassing story about how I found this film. <laughs> that's, that's kind of what we draw on, so... Please. As uh, as most preteens do, I spent a lot of time on Pinterest growing up, and I remember pinning a still from this film and thinking like, "Wow, this is so beautiful." Oh wow! It, it, it's it's an icon. <laughs> it's an iconic image from one of the bathroom scenes, and I think they're talking about love or existence, and it's completely out of context totally not within the director's intended meaning, but I just saw that image and thought, wow, that's, that has to be an incredible film. So I remember looking it up, keeping it in my uh, to watch list for a couple years because foreign film kind of frightened me at that point. And then returning to it once I started taking a Russian cinema class um, in college. And then I watched it for the first time, totally did not understand anything that happens. Um, <laughs> but then I returned to it a couple years later and I really started to fall in love with it. Yeah, I think that that's sort of how most films of this nature go. I mean, obviously the film is experimental and um, experimental films heavily rely on juxtaposition and you know how images are sort of understood when in their full context. And so obviously when you watch a film like Daisy's for the first time, nothing is going to make sense because the film doesn't really care to, and it, I mean, which fits, this is fitting in the spirit of the film, but it has no interest in sort of like guiding you along. It's not a fairy tale. There's no, like, even despite the imagery that is used, it's not a fairy tale. It's a complete anarchic explosion of randomness. And I was curious... Uh, when you first watched the film, even if you, even when not understanding it, were there any particular, I mean, there are so many images in this film uh, to think of, but were there any particular images that stood out on a first viewing as like, okay, I don't know what's going on, but like, I see something here that I can like admire and like, I can, I can take in in some way. My first thought is that I was so attracted to all of the images of the food. And I remember thinking like, why are there so many meals? Why are they eating all the time? I don't get it. <laughs> and then I, the more I thought about it, the more I saw kind of this connection to, um, between food and flesh. And I don't know, I've become really obsessed with that kind of imagery in my own work. So that really stuck out to me upon my first viewing. And also I'm just a hungry person. <laughs> So I love watching people eat. It's one of my favorite things. It's all like, the food looks great. I feel like there are so many, like there's a whole culture within like Miyazaki's films where people are just obsessed with the food. And so why not obsess about the food here? And I mean, like, 
there's so much about this film that's about decadence and about just like completely over ringing the like uh the excess and so i think food plays a huge part of it tell me a little bit about i mean i think the food and flesh idea is literally present in this film there's the scene where they where um one of the lovers of uh i don't remember which one is marie one and marie two uh, Marie one is the one with the dark hair and okay, Marie see, two is the red haired girl with short hair. See, that makes sense because I think Marie two is just Julia. <laughs> I think I, <laughs> I, cause in that scene, this guy keeps calling her Julia and he's like uh, professing his love for her. And as they're doing this, they're just completely cutting in and destroying like every possible phallic food you can imagine. They cut up pickles of like a croissant that I'm sorry, but that croissant looked disturbingly like a penis. I'm just saying, <laughs> as a man in particular, it was just an observation that I made, and that's fine. But, like, the croissant, the pickle, the hot dog, the banana, all of these things are just being completely destroyed. Julia, pořád na tebe čekám. Bojím se, že tě už nikdy neuvidí. And so I think that food as flesh idea is literally present in that scene. And I was wondering if you could talk to me a little bit more about that, like food as flesh, like what about that idea is attractive to you is and especially in your own work how do you kind of translate that these girls are really they're at the bottom of the food chain in a sense they have very little power in this society that they're growing up in so they're kind of reclaiming their power in these scenes they realize that they can use their youth as like a tool to get money and food and men and that's the only way that they know how to survive. I'm thinking of one scene in particular where Marie Chu is naked and she's like holding the butterflies in front of her so that she's c covered and no one can really see her naked. Um, and she's, she's not even paying attention to the man. She's just completely focused on finding her next meal. And she's just like, where's the food? I'm hungry. <laughs> <laughs> and what that's saying is that she wants to maintain her freedom and she doesn't want to be pinned down by someone else. She's kind of like that butterfly in a sense that she's holding over her It chest. is one of the most beautiful images in the film. I, that's probably one of my favorite scenes in the film. And that scene with the butterflies over specifically her areas of sexuality mm -hmm. is incredible. I think it's an incredibly powerful image. Julie. Co prosím? Promiň. Yeah, in that moment, she has the upper hand and... That's the way she wants to keep it. It is kind of this tragic story where the where these women try to find themselves and through finding themselves and completely becoming anarchic, they they end up falling into this nihilist, destru literally destruction, like nihilist destruction. And then they make a complete 180, but that's it still doesn't, it's not it doesn't enough. solve anything. And so you're left with this like, oh, uh, like, what do we do? <laughs> like, you know, like, I don't, like, I don't know. And so I, I think that, those moments that you're talking about of, of the women finding their regaining their uh, power makes the ending even more of like a powerful, like, ah, shit, like, you know, like moment where you're like, what, what is going on? What do we do? I was wondering if you could tell me about, you know, an experience watching this film that maybe had a particular significance or if you had any observations through rewatching it again a second time. Obviously, we've talked about in rewatching it, there's more to gain. But I was wondering if there was any particular experience that you had in which something very major was elucidated, or maybe it was the context of the experience that was meaningful to you. Uh, I'd be very curious to hear about that. This film has kind of a, a personal significance to me. My, my mom is an immigrant from Hungary, and she grew up under a communist regime. So 
kind of like a very similar background to her own upbringing um, as in the film. So I played it with her the second time I watched it just to kind of have a, a more accurate lens, I guess, because the first time I had seen it, I wasn't really old enough to understand it or have any idea of the historical significance. And then when I watched it with my mom, I just remember thinking like, this is kind of a momentous moment in cinema that this film even exists. <laughs> and and she said the same thing, that she just, she couldn't believe a movie like this exists in the world. It's, I mean, it's just kind of insane and um, unlikely. <laughs> and, 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 and like, like you said, um, it wasn't well received at first by the government. It was banned after it was released and it didn't play for years and she couldn't find work for years. Vera, Vera Hijlova, the director of the film, to clarify. She couldn't find work. She had to use a pseudonym as she switched over to the world of commercial directing. She actually uh, worked under her husband's name for a few years. I'm, I'm just kind of in awe of how she overcame that and made something that still resonates today. It was really special watching it with my mom because I know that she has these experiences that I can't really understand. And in that moment, we both, we got a little closer because we both were at a point of understanding that we hadn't been at previously. First of all, sharing movies with your parents is hard. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I don't have many. Limited options. Limited, uh, especially for people like us who like kind of thrive on provocative films and material we both love it when we can watch something that will like it will utilize certain subject matter and images that other people may find uncomfortable in the effort to elucidate a, tr a certain truth and it it is really really special when you can find a film that for whatever reason you can share it with someone else. Did your mom like the film? Did your mom have like thoughts on the film? Like what like what did she have to say about it besides the obvious historical stuff? I feel like I must preface this with this answer by saying that my mom's not really a movie person. That only makes the answer <laughs> better. I can't I really can't wait for it honestly. She's she's not much of a movie person, so I will say it didn't uh capture her interest in the same way it did mine. To put it to put it nicely, um, I think she got the metaphor pretty quickly, and she was like, "All right, let's get it over with." Um, but she enjoyed it, and I mean, she she recognizes when the cinematography is beautiful, and that there are really interesting editing choices. As a whole, was it her favorite film? As it is mine. <laughs> Hey guys, I hope you're enjoying this week's episode of My Favorite Movie Is. I hate to interrupt this awesome conversation, but I just wanted to remind you all that you can find more episodes of My Favorite Movie Is by going to our show page on your podcasting platform of choice. And if you like video podcasts, we actually post our video versions for every podcast episode on YouTube. New audio episodes drop every other Monday, and then video episodes drop that following Friday. So I hope you'll subscribe and follow us and hit that notification bell and do all the things you got to do to stay updated on when new episodes go live. Another way to stay updated on when new episodes go live and get some fun bonus content and sneak peeks in between episodes is to follow us on our social media pages at MFMI Podcast on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. I hope you guys will find us there and stay updated and check out all the cool stuff we're doing on those platforms. And finally, for a full catalog of audio and video episodes, as well as more information about the show and how you can contact us for any reason, you can go to mfmipodcast.com. Thank you so much for listening to My Favorite Movie Is. Let's get back to the show. Another topic that I know you have in your work, something that's tracing your work, is obviously the female friendship and women and sort of women's perspectives, which obviously that is just who you are and that is just who you are as a filmmaker and that's what you bring to your films. I was curious if we could talk a little bit about this film and how it has inspired your work. And, you know, this is also just a great excuse for you to give me any more takes you have on this film, any more things that you really would love to just bring up or discuss. Um, you know, what are the, some of the other images or ideas in this film that you take as a filmmaker and put into your own work? 
I remember thinking as I watched this film that I haven't seen a female friendship like this. Um, maybe that's because there's not really a good introduction to them as characters <laughs> because <laughs> who are these women? We're kind of just dropped into their world and we have to piece their relationship together. Um, I think the first time I watched it, I thought they were lovers. Mm, and then I mean, the that's, not a, that's not a, a particularly wrong reading. I right. Think. I still see my points. Um even today, but now I think I have a little bit more of a nuanced perspective. And then in my second viewing, I realized that Marie too is is actually um, posing as Marie one's sister in the pranks. And that really complicated my understanding of who they were to each other. And now whenever I see them on screen, I just think that every relationship is like this, or at, at least in my in my experience with all of my closest friends, there's always this closeness that can get confusing at times and maybe crosses boundaries a little bit. I, I mean, it's just so intense because women have this kind of shared experience that not all men can um, understand. And especially in this film, because they are in this low position of power and they want to create havoc, we have to rely on each other so intensely. I think it's really interesting, fascinating, and slightly um, bizarre. And so I've always, I don't know, I, I really like creating similar kinds of relationships in my own work. My thesis film has two female protagonists and I, I really took a lot of inspiration from daisies because women are complicated creatures. <laughs> so I've heard. <laughs> I just think there's something really special about the way they interact with each other versus how they interact with the world. It's super different. How would you say that rela that relationship is different? How would you say their interactions between each other are different than the... I mean, I might know the answer to this already, but for for the sake of conversation, what would you well, say that difference what, what, what is? What would you say? I'm, I'm curious. I think that when they are together, there is a sort of... There's like a comfortability. There's a rawness b between each other, not only physically, but also just like... You know, they don't have to they don't have their game faces on, I guess, in a weird way to put it. Um, that's a that's a great way of saying it, though. They, yeah. they don't have to have any kind of pretense with each other. They're totally honest um, because they know they won't be judged. They will be completely accepted. Um, I'm thinking of like one line at the end where Marie to says like, I'm so happy, I love you so much. And she looks at Marie one and she says, don't you love me? Can't you say it back? And the other girl doesn't. But then her actions are completely in contradiction to that. I mean, they spend every second together. They trust each other completely to save each other from the pranks that they're in. So everything points to the fact that they have like, love for each other that they don't feel for other people. I think there's something um, super raw, like you said, super honest. In my second viewing, I noticed that the, that the two Maries sort of start in different places and kind of cross streams somewhere along the way and potentially end up in the opposite places, meaning Marie one is sort of more is is uh, more interested in the sort of love and affection, and she kind of has this like she sees what that it's possible. There's that scene where, you know, whoever that that guy is, that lover, that butterfly lover, as I'll now call him henceforth, uh, is pro is professing his love, and she hears this, and it's like, oh my goodness, like what is this? Like, what is this affection? Like, I want to, this is something I want to explore. And then Marie too hangs up the phone, and she goes like, what are you doing? Why'd you do that? And Marie, too, is like pure anarchy. Like, we're taking advantage of these men. We are taking money from them and their food. And Marie, one, is very much like, but I, I kind of like this. I like the affection that, I, that I'm getting from these men. And in a, there's a, obviously, they both are also in on the anarchy together. But Marie, one, has this thing where there's a little bit more of a, of a, of a care for that kind of attention. And then I think, I can't exactly pin where, but somewhere over the course of the movie, Marie 
uh, two begins to realize through Marie one's pushing of her that she also wants that attention and wants that sort of affection from somebody in a meaningful way, but will not let herself accept the fact that she wants that. And Marie won in a sort of, I don't know if it's a coping mechanism, but in because she has been denied of those things from Marie too, begins to go f- into full on anarchy. Uh, and there's like, she begins to enjoy the more of the crazy pranks. And I don't, again, I don't think it's perfectly drawn. I think obviously they're both in on the anarchy and there are moments where they're both in sync with each other. But I noticed this just very, very small moments that I think you can see that. And that's why at the end of the film, it's so kind of meaningful and profound because now they've sort of ended up on the opposite ends. It just, I don't know. Again, I can't fully put my finger on it like you can't, but that I did notice that. and, And I'm not sure if you would agree but that is something that I noticed and something that I think adds a whole it it gives them they because I think people when they see this film, they will question like, what is this about? Who are these characters? I don't know who these are because I have that complaint all the time when I watch movies that I don't understand. Like, who are these characters? What is this story? What does this even mean? And I think that they're despite that this film is very experimental, you know, there are characters. Marie one and Marie two are characters and they are different from each other and they are fleshed out in a way. I don't know. I'm not sure if I, I w- would you, would you say that? Would you agree with that potentially? I don't think I agree. I, I, I see what you're saying and there's definitely a shift to me. It's not so much a desire for outside affection. I, I never really, I don't know if I see that in either of the women. I always felt like they were really satisfied with their own kind of contained relationship, their their love for each other. Um, But I do see a massive shift, especially in Marie Tu's character, um, following the their adventures in the countryside, um, where she she starts to realize that people aren't paying attention to her, and she's she's feeling this um, existential dread that we all feel in our (laughs) mid-20s. And I I think at that point, she starts to realize that she has a meaning or she exists or she knows she exists based on her impact on other people. Like when she sees the mess that she's left behind, she knows she's a real person and she knows that she passed through this place and so after that moment of realization she realizes that she's important as long as she's important to another person and so it really becomes really important to her that marie one loves her back that's why it's like really hard for her not to hear the other character say those words even though she of course means them i think that's my reading of it a že vůbec si, no ty, no vlastně ano. Jinak by se to dalo u tebe těžko dokázat. Hele, hlášená zde nejsi, nikde nepracuješ, vidíš, na tebe není důkaz. I guess when I when I said that Marie too was like looking for affection in that way because I just I'm thinking about the scene in particular where Marie one goes to Marie two and says okay well give me his address like I'm gonna go and Marie two is like hmm, thing in the corner like okay fine whatever here you go here's your address like go ahead and it's that that scene to me is like I, I, but I think it's not really the outside affection it's what you're talking about it's more so like meaning something to someone. I think that's what Marie one sees in that in that moment that Marie two won't allow herself to accept, and so that's why that scene at the end is so great that you're talking about because it's like, tell me you love me, like I now accept that, and I want to hear it 
from you and I want it and she can't get it. Right. Like nothing really matters. I mean, obviously they're just creating chaos everywhere around them, but nothing really matters to them except each other. And so really the only thing that matters is those three little words, but um, <laughs> she, she can't, she can't get them out of her friends. It's kind of sad. It is, but that works perfectly at the end of the film, which is just an incredible, like it's, it's one of my favorite, it's my favorite kind of ending. Which is that ultimately we and we spoke about this on a previous episode um, where we talked about how an ending sort of you go completely in one direction and that doesn't satisfy you and you go completely in the other direction that doesn't satisfy you and you find synthesis. I don't think the film gives you the synthesis. I think that you that the that the viewer has to find the synthesis and understanding that both complete anarchy and um, complete submission to the system both are not meaningful right they're going to have the same result right and i hope that that is was the intention because i don't know i don't know what the intention was and part of me read in like my very small research that that ending was put there as a way to concede to the czech government as a way Mm. for them to be like look they're they're working, see? And, you know, like as a way to sort of subvert the censors. But I really do think, I would like to think that this filmmaker put that there as an actual synthesis kind of, a moment to to explore that synthesis and not just to evade censorship. I, I don't think she did anything to appease the government, in my opinion. Just because I, I think of the dedication at the end. It says at the end, um, dedicated to those who get upset over a stomped upon bed of lettuce. I think I think that's it. I mean, she's being tongue in cheek by saying that this film is making fun of the people who get upset over the excess and the wasting of the food in the film, but who aren't getting upset over greater evils. On a so much fun discussion, so much analysis, my favorite. But now it's time to just get the fast, raw answers with the MFMI lightning round, which is a series of questions in which we ask you your favorite things about this movie, as well as a couple of additional questions on the side that are fun. Are you ready? I guess so. Uh, favorite scene? My favorite scene is when they're in the bedroom cutting each other up and it becomes this really cool montage. Yeah. Oh, my God. We, we didn't even talk about like the, the crazy collage aesthetics in the film and and uh, the visual effects, which are incredible. They're, they still are incredible. And that scene, I think, is um, emblematic of that. Absolutely. Well, this is our chance to talk about it, but quickly, because I know this is lightning round. Yes. I mean... But she is just so ahead yeah. of her time. Um, she's using these special effects that I don't even see today. That's mm. so- something that I don't know how she accomplished with film. Um, but she literally would cut into the characters on film and apply them on a blank uh, still so that it looks like their heads were moving separately from their body. And it's just so cool. It is. I mean, that's that was pre-masking. We do it all the time now, but she did it physically on the film stock, and it looks honestly immaculate yeah, for the time. It's, it's really well done. Avati. You'd think that a film like this that was made in the 60s would like have so many like constraints on it. And it did, obviously. But the visual effects are incredible. And it's they were able to create so much powerful imagery through the visual effects and the color changes that, you know, you do not see in films made during this time. Even during the 60s, when it felt like there was so much more happening in film, you know, in comparison to previous decades. I think about the masterful cutting from black and white to color. Um, and there's a great cut where like Marie one, like pulls Marie two down or something. And then Marie two falls on a stool in the bathroom. Yeah. And you're like, what? Like, it's like (laughs) crazy good match cuts like that in a film from the 60s. Yeah. They're constantly transitioning between different sets and locations. And I, I, I don't know. I think especially the last time I watched it, I was just like, 
I, I went with it. Like I didn't even feel the changes anymore. And I, I just, I mean, that's just the sign of a master. I think the, the true devil's trick in this film is how some transitions are so noticeable and how some of them are like ridiculously smooth, yeah. like to a degree that is almost frightening uh, mm -hmm. for that time. Favorite character or if different favorite performance. I like the, um, bathroom attendant <laughs> <laughs> the soul she's the so, true she's heart so and soul sweet. yeah she's i don't know she reminds me of my grandmother so <laughs> i i really loved her she's she sings to the girls and she never judges them she's always um i don't know just a genuine creature she's she's like the one good character in the film because i i would argue that the marie's are pretty awful even no yeah I they're deplorable them. for sure but yeah. <laughs> the but she does she does sing that one line about the flower crown which is the only time that that imagery is really like put into the text of the film mm -hmm. and it's, it's such a powerful moment Ověnčit ten plavý vlastůj, rudé růže mám tak rád. Favorite shot or sequence of shots? I noticed it this time around, and I don't even remember this scene the last time I watched it, but I really liked the um, way that she cuts between them looking and then what they see when they're at the farm. That is the music kind of swells and the yes. farmer looks at them and looks away. It's like this is like kind of beautiful, like a, like a farm vista almost. Yeah. And I mean, that's the first time I think that uh, the director is not commenting negatively on a lifestyle. I think she really <laughs> she really does like think that the farmer is leading a a, a good lifestyle and something that should be. um imitated versus like the girls who she clearly thinks are little devils. Co dělá? Bude zalévat. favorite uh set or location i don't know if that might be the same i don't know if it might be different oh no that's different i i adore the scenes in the garden with the tree and the peaches that's you know calling back to my preteen days where i would right. that is the pinterest stills. aesthetic scene yes exactly um but i adore those beautiful floral backgrounds i just think they're so angelic and beautiful there is a really that scene is also really fun because it's obviously a hearkening to sort of the forbidden fruit exactly. uh, and eden during that moment but they chose they make it a peach instead of an apple which is obviously more of a a feminine fruit um but also is sort of a, a piece of innocence and it's just a brilliant artistic choice, I think. And how fun is the dancing in that scene? <laughs> they're dancing I mean, around like bunny rabbits. Like... It's so cute. Again, complete anarchy, honestly. Full anarchy, uh, even in the cute way. Favorite piece of trivia or behind the scenes knowledge or know-how? Vera, in interviews following the release of this film, said that this wasn't a feminist film. <laughs> I think that's really funny. <laughs> She denies it. Favorite response you've gotten from somebody when you've told them about how much you love this film or if it's one of your favorite films? A lot of people don't understand <laughs> and they'll watch the first scene and be like, okay, that's enough. <laughs> Which is so funny because so many responses to this question are like, oh yeah, that tracks. That makes sense. <laughs> oh, you love Back to the Future so much? Oh yeah, okay, I get it. <laughs> Meanwhile, this film is like, ooh, uh oh <laughs> I remember once talking to a coworker and they had asked me my favorite film. So I mentioned this film and some Agnes Varda because I love Agnes Varda. Um, and they were like, but what do you watch with your friends? And I was like, okay, you got me there. Oh, you got me Varda. there. <laughs> 
I mean, this isn't like a casual viewing situation. But. Not at all. It's also, <laughs> Daisy is also ironically one of the very few films I would say works better in the day than it works at night. I agree with you. Yeah. That's an interesting point. Yeah. I, I do need to be very awake and caffeinated to watch yeah, this Yeah, I feel like a lot of casual films are best in the evening, like for a mm-hmm. movie night or something. But no, no, no. This is the first movie that you watch in the day at like 2 p.m. when there's the sun out and you've had breakfast. Yeah. Your second favorite movie, the movie that loses in the cage match to Daisy's. Either Casanova Gene or Beanpole or The Rider. That's a, those, that's a lot of fighters. I thought you were going to yeah. say Cleo. Where's Cleo? Cleo's in there. She's in there. If you had to pair Daisy's, with another film to make a sort of double feature, a double header, what film would you pick? My tentative answer is 13 by Katherine Hardwick. It's a coming of age story about two, well, a 13 year old girl who makes a new best friend and her life is completely turned upside down. And it's about friendship, specifically female friendships, which is one of the themes that I would compare. Um, but it's also examining society, but, you know, a contemporary American society that's super focused on drugs and sex and clothes. and But, but similarly, you know, commenting on our materialistic ways. So I think they would pair well together. I was thinking potentially water lilies. Uh, by oh, Celine Siava, who, for okay. those who don't know, she directed Portrait of a Lady on, a Portrait of a Lady on Fire, which mm-hmm. is obviously exploded uh, last year and is one of my has b- slowly become one of my all time favorite films. See, I was trying to think of an answer to this question, and obviously, you're the lightning round person, so you're the one who needs to have an answer to this question. <laughs> I like to also bring in my thoughts, and I was thinking, like, God, what do I even pick for this? Because mm-hmm. there's no other film. Like this, and I was thinking, like, okay, maybe Thelma and Louise would work, or like maybe That's, like a that came up in my mind too. Yeah, Thelma and Louise would work, but maybe maybe like something from uh, like the silent film filmography, like something like a like a Chaplin or a Keaton film. But that still didn't fit. And then you just told me about Thirteen, and I'm like, you know what, Water Lilies would totally be a great uh, other film. Water Lilies would be good. Man, we're good. We're good at this. Look we, at us. We have good taste. Look at our <laughs> range. We've made it through the lightning round. We did it. Where can we find you? Where can we find your work? Do you have any projects that are coming up that people, because you are currently, still currently a working filmmaker and an actress. And so are there any projects that you have that people can look forward to? Well, you can watch my thesis film, Crumbs, coming soon. <laughs> um, you can uh, look look for updates on my website, Uh Keep an eye out for films from Killer Films because I will be putting my blood, sweat, and tears into those <laughs> projects. A uh, project called What If, another one called Past Lives. They're going to be amazing. Anna, thank you so much for being here. It was a pleasure to have you. Pleasure to talk about this film with you. Thank you so much. And as somebody who has seen a previous version of the thesis film of Crumbs, um, I am super excited for people to get to see it. And especially if they've listened to this episode to see how perhaps watching this film can inform how they can watch your uh, Crumbs. And that's really exciting for me. So thank you so much for being here. It was so much fun to talk about this movie with you. Thank you for having me. I had such a good time. It's always a pleasure to get to talk to Anna about anything and everything, but especially great films. Another thank you to her for being on the show. Her website is linked in the show notes below. If you enjoyed this episode of My Favorite Movie Is, go ahead and follow us on your podcasting app of choice. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit that notification bell. Follow us on social media at MFMI Podcast on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and Facebook. And lastly, if you are an Apple Podcasts user, please give us a rating and review. All of these things helps to keep the show going and growing. So however you choose to engage, we thank you. For more information about the show, you can visit us at our website, mfmipodcast.com. And if you have any sponsorship or business inquiries, if you have any feedback on the show, or if you just want to say hi, you can email us at hello at mfmipodcast.com. Until next time, thanks for listening. My Favorite Movie Is is a Larry Freed Presents production. It is executive produced, hosted, created, and directed by me, 
Larry Freed, and is also produced by me alongside Brian Novak. Our assistant director is Steven Reyes, and our editors are myself, as well as Clayton and Kimberly Allen. Our graphic designer is Monica Sarmiento, our motion graphics designer is Elton Greenfield, and our theme song, Now and Then, as well as all original music featured on this show, is composed and performed by Matt Gorduke. For this episode, our camera operator was Rob Bond, and our sound recordist was producer Brian Novak. Thank you to everybody who helps make this show possible. Everybody's websites and socials and what have you are listed down in the show notes below. My name is Larry Freed, and this has been My Favorite Movie Is. Is.